Hi there, this is Janet Gershen Siegel, and I'm the Lonely Writer. This is serious social media help for the independent author. This is my capstone project for Quinnipiac University for my master's degree, and it's about independent authors who are authors who do not have agents. And today I am speaking with uh, uh, professional author Dayton Ward. So uh, welcome. How you doing? <laughs> I'm I'm good. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm being all independent and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> so um I uh well let's uh, let's start with uh, can you uh tell me a little bit about yourself? Oh, well what do you want to know? My secret origin or um I'm basically a full-time writer. Okay. Uh, I'm a freelance writer. I write for multiple clients. Uh I usually have two or three things going at the same time in various stages of development. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been doing it full-time for about going on 2 years. It'll be 2 years in September. Uh, prior to that, I was a software developer uh, for Corporate America. I spent a lot of years working for companies like Sprint and Hewlett Packard. And prior to that, I was in the military where I was also a software developer. Okay. So I've had kind of a long, odd career. And writing was something I took up as a hobby, uh, what, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago? Just something to as a creative outlet. Mm -hmm. And things just kind of spiraled out of control after that. Well, things really spiraled out of control, as far as I can tell, because uh, you have uh, just under 50 books listed on Amazon, but uh, the biggie is uh, is a book called um, uh, Star Trek The Fall Peaceable Kingdoms. And uh, one thing I want to tell listeners is that uh, uh, Dayton is a tie-in author for, uh, for Star Trek. And I know sometimes people think that that's a... Um, kind of a fan fiction writer who got lucky, and I know that's not really what happened here. So can you talk a little bit about how you got that gig and also a bit about Peaceable Kingdoms itself? I'm a fan fiction writer who got lucky. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dayton. Really not that far from the truth. I mean, it's there is are elements of truth to that statement. Mm -hmm. um, I did start writing uh, by doing a little fan fiction. Yes, uh, I have a few fan fiction credits that have appeared in various print zines years and years and years ago. I'm not, I don't want to say the number because it just sounds bad when I say it out loud. <laughs> um, but what happened was Pocket Books, who is the current publisher of Star Trek novels, they started a contest called Strange New Worlds, which was a, a short story contest for new writers, unpublished writers. And so I sent a short story in to them for their first ever contest back in 1997. And I was one of the first winners picked for that contest. So I got a contract. They printed, they published the book. Uh, I got paid for it. It was really cool. Um, I started submitting regular stories, or original science fiction stories to magazines like Asimov's and Analog and the magazine of science fiction and fantasy and getting rejected because, you know, looking back on some of those stories, they were really badly written. Um, and then the next year, uh, Pocket did a second Strange New Worlds story or a contest and I submitted a story to that and it was picked and printed in that year's anthology. And then when I did it for the third time, that's when I rendered myself ineligible to enter that contest because now I'm in quotes, you know, a professional writer because I've attained the minimum number of credits to be listed as a professional. At which point the editor of the contest and the editor of the book line called me and asked me if I was interested in writing a Star Trek novel. Uh, I had never written a novel before. I'd never written anything longer than a short story before. So, of course, I said, sure, that sounds like a great idea. What could possibly go wrong? What the hell? <laughs> and that is my origin story. I have been writing for Pocket Books ever since. And uh, in um, 2014, I do believe, uh, in January of 2014, uh, a little something happened on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, number 13 Peaceable Kingdoms by Dayton Ward for Pocket Books. Uh, I want to talk about that. That's uh, that that's got to be the dream of a lot of people. So uh, what happened? Well, I mean, uh, the book was the fifth in a five book uh, story arc that Pocket had put out, and it, for those of you that have the Star Trek persuasion, it was uh, a series of books using the Next Generation Deep Space Nine characters, and it was a big political. Uh, story that was that spanned the five books, and mine was the I batted cleanup uh, for this particular set of stories. And four of the five books made the bestseller list. Uh, the only reason the first one didn't make it was because at the time, uh, Barnes and Noble and Simon and Schuster were having a bit of a spat as far as uh, ordering and placement of books in the stores and that kind of thing. So that kind of affected order numbers. So poor David R. George III, who was already a New York Times bestseller, by the way. Um, 
didn't have his first book listed, uh, but all of the other subsequent books uh, hit the bestseller list, and each one did just a little bit better than the one that came before it, and so I got blessed by hitting it at number 13 as a debut. Uh, it lasted about a week. <laughs> you know, hey, you know. Know. But, you know, according to publishing, you know, it's kind of like being an Academy Award nominee or an Emmy Award nominee. You can use that forever for marketing purposes. And so I was branded. I have a, you know, a tag around my neck. <laughs> uh, I get a special discount at the cafeteria and all that kind of cool stuff. And, but I mean, no, and apparently it does. It does motivate sales. I mean, people will tend to take it a little bit more seriously if they see that moniker above the person's name on the book cover. Absolutely. Uh, I, I don't know if that's true. I don't, you know, but uh, I'll take it. Well, well, sure, and, and you know, we won't talk about your microchip, but uh, the the yeah, thing. I forgot about the microchip. <laughs> Well, the thing that that impressed me also about the series is that it's uh, it's clearly a collaborative venture, and uh, uh, one of the things I think a lot of independent writers may feel is that you're independent, you're independent all the way, so you're sort of the lone ranger and you're doing everything on your own. But your experience, at least certainly for uh, the Fall series in particular, uh, is rather different. So, do you want to talk a little bit about that, please? Yes, it's uh, the fall miniseries uh, was very collaborative. Uh, the five of us uh, worked in concert with each other for months uh, ahead of t- even ahead of time, even before the first writer in the in the in the group, uh, David R. George, got to write his first book. We were all we were still collaborating with each other. We were sending emails back and forth. We were talking on the phone sometimes with people. I spent a three hour afternoon session talking with James Swallow who uh, wrote the fourth book in the series so that I could correctly take the baton he was holding out at the end of his book and then collect all the different plot lines that had been left spinning by the other three authors and try to wrap it all up in my book. Um, We even had a spreadsheet. It was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was a gigantic spreadsheet because the idea of the story is that it takes place over a 60-day period um, motivated by the events that kick off the series in the first book and so we had a spreadsheet that literally broke down that 60 day period day by day so that we could know where each of the characters and each of the spaceships and each of the villains were in relation to each other throughout that 60 day period. Um, it was insane. It was kind of like, uh, being the guy from a beautiful mind, you know, and he's scribbling all over the walls, (laughs) you know, Benny Russell. And, um, so, and, and at the time, the, I was the, the things were comp- more complicated for me because at the time I was the only one of the four, of the five of us who had a full time job in addition to trying to write. Um, Una McCormick was the one who came closest because she is a, she's a professor at university over in England, mm-hmm. and she writes her books during her hiatus, and so she gets to write one a year during her months off. You know, so she was writing her book during her vacation period if you call it that and then I was the only one who was batting you know with a real day job so I was you know I was putting in 50 60 hour weeks at my day job and then coming home oh, and having to write uh, and so, um but but I know you quit your day job at some point so when when was that uh September 2014 that was when I finally uh opted for <laughs> a, a, a lifestyle change <laughs> fantastic uh, fantastic but no, I mean, as far as the collaboration, yeah, we worked we worked very much in concert with each other throughout the writing of the five books. Uh, we were always comparing notes with each other. We were making sure we were in step with each other. Uh, if someone, if 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 a character appeared in more than one book, we made sure that their portrayal was consistent across the books. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of emails. I mean, I imagine the emails could probably fill their own book. Probably and and uh, you know it's, and certainly when when somebody creates a new character in particular, you want to uh, you want to respect the the creator's vision. You don't want to you know suddenly turn that person in, into something else. You know you, you know it, it's a you know you you don't want Scotty to become an Eskimo or whatever or or something comparable. Well, I mean we had and we had a we had a an antagonist who was gonna who, who was the true nature of the of the antagonist was going to be revealed over the course of the later books. I mean, he was introduced early on, but you don't really get a lot of insight into his character. Everything is shown from other people's point of view, so you don't really get a look in his head uh, until my book, at, at which point, you know, the motivations that, and, the, and the hints that we've been dropping over four books start to bear fruit. And, I mean, in theory, that was the idea. Whether I, we pulled it off or not, that's for the reader to decide. But um, So we were always back and forth about, well, we 
how do we portray this character in this book? Okay, can he do X, Y, Z? And you can set it up here, and then I can take that when I get the character in my book, and it'll all make sense back then. Uh, so it was uh, definitely a lot of give and take, a lot of back and forth, a lot of uh, no egos. We were all working toward a, the same goal of making all the books the best they could be. So that part was fun. Definitely. And, uh, you know, so everybody's uh, dropping breadcrumbs here and there. Uh now, uh, my uh, my question is also uh, uh, while we're talking, I'm showing a bunch of stuff on the screen for uh, for various properties that you've worked on, such as Mars Attacks and uh, and Twenty Four. But uh, so my my question is, what is sort of your do you have a writing routine, and and if so, what is it like? Okay, well the plan the plan is to wake up every day, <laughs> and it's I, I sort of treat it like a work day. I mean, uh, having kids helps with some structure because they have to be places and. Uh, particularly during the school year, you know, you get up, you get them dressed, you get them fed, you get them on the school bus, and then I come back and I, I work throughout the day until they come home from school. And then uh, there's after after school activities and they like to eat and so I feed them on occasion. <laughs> I know it's crazy. Um, um, so I do that sort of thing. So the kid, during the school year, it's a lot easier to have structure because there's already a built-in calendar or schedule for the day anyway. And I just use the kids' departure and arrivals as my anchor points for, my, for the bulk of my writing. Uh, and then if I'm really on a deadline or if I'm just feeling it, I'll go back to it after dinner or after they go to bed, that kind of thing, and work until I just can't stay awake anymore. Um, a lot of that is still an old habit from when I was writing full-time or writing while working full-time because mm -hmm. I would usually not start writing for the evening until about 10, 10.30 at night, and I would work until 2 or 3 in the morning and then get up at 7 and do it all over again. Oh, man. Well, um, you, you, have to, you have to take advantage of whatever time you've got. Um, yeah. About how many words do you write in a day, would, would you say? Do you have a specific number in mind that you have to hit? I don't have a number that I say I want to hit this number uh, unless I'm on a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, I have to write X number of words a day if I'm going to hit the deadline. Because I tend to, it tends to, if you if you try to tie it that way, at least for me, uh, you start to work against your own goal. Apparently, mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, when I get when I get firing on all cylinders, I can write five or six thousand words a day. Terrific. Now, uh, what happens on bad days when there's just nothing in the tank at all? What do you do? Oh, I, well, I mean, I drink a lot. No, <laughs> um, there are. There are a few bad. There are days when I just don't feel like doing it. It's like I mean, you, you know, you, people talk about writer's block and they talk about the muse isn't playing. You know what? Some days you just want to watch, you just want to binge watch Daredevil on Netflix or whatever. <laughs> okay, and there are those days. I um, I try to minimize them, uh, but and during the summer, those kind of days actually turn into well, you know what? I think I'll take the kids to to the Lego Land or something. You know that kind of thing. I'll 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 make that a day, but. Um, I try not to have too many of those those days, sure. uh, particularly during the week. Uh, I try to treat it like a regular job. So during the week, I really try to you know uh, push hard and work long hours, and then that way I can relax a little bit on the weekends. And the weekends are sort of there as a safety valve if I get behind a little bit. Like okay, you know what, I'm I'm lagging behind where I'd like to be on this project, so I'll I'll you know I'll put half a day toward it on Sunday or something like that. Okay. Um, now, what's uh, I, I know one person you love to co collaborate with is Kevin Dilmore. Well, it's sort of a blackmail thing, but yeah. <laughs> no, uh, Kevin and I have been friends for years, and we've been collaborating for almost as long. Um, we met because of the, the Strange New Worlds contest. He was actually writing for a Star Trek magazine, um, and he got the assignment to interview the first crop of Strange New Worlds winners. And in the process of reaching out to contact those those winners, he discovered that he and I lived 45 minutes apart. So we he asked me if I wanted to meet him halfway, and we'd have a beer, and he'd give me he'd, he'd interview me that way. Uh, he could have just as easily emailed me the questions, and that would have been the end of it. But uh, as it happens, he invited me to a beer. We sat down, we did the interview in a half an hour, and then spent two hours bsing. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, we're hanging out. You know, going to the conventions and doing all the nerd things, and uh, our wives are thrilled that we finally have a playmate. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, so that's the way that went. And then, you know, we we actually collaborated on a magazine article first, and and then did fiction later. And uh, and and for those who did not know, um, uh, Dayton lives in a super secret lair in the center of the country. <laughs> yeah, I live in the Kansas City area. 
Uh, I moved here in the 90s, in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. And um, so what would um, what would you say your best advice is for, a, um, for an independent author, such as yourself or myself or someone like us? Just you have to you have to write every day something. It doesn't have to be a five thousand words or five hundred words or whatever. But just you gotta you gotta flex the muscles. Mm-hmm. Uh, you gotta write something, even if it's just ordering your grocery list or something. But you gotta you gotta stretch those muscles every day, just like working any other muscle. You have to do it repeatedly every day. Um, and read. God for. Uh, uh, for God's sake, read. I, I see. I get so many people who come up to me and tell me they want to be a writer, but they don't read. I'm like, well, how, what do you what do you have to talk about? <laughs> it, it, <laughs> what are you going to write about? You know, it's a. Uh, where do you get your ideas from? Where do you where do you how do you how do you form your ideas? Where do you what do you add? Pers- how do you add perspective to your ideas? I don't I don't understand people who don't read, but they want to be writers. I, I, I think also you, you just sort of have to have experiences. You know, you don't necessarily have to go skydiving, but you need to sort of, you know, you, you've got to leave your, your comfort zone and, and get outside and do something so that you have something to base, base it on. It's either personal experiences or just things that you're passionate about or causes that you believe in or something that pisses you off on the news or, you know, and there's plenty of that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just, uh, I mean... I, it's great when a, when a teenager comes up to me and tells me they want to write. You want you definitely want to encourage that. And you know, yes, you could you could take the cynical approach. Well, he's fifteen; he hasn't had anything to write about yet. I'm like, oh, well, that's not necessarily true. They're, we kids are a lot smarter and absorb a lot more than we give them credit for. Sometimes um, they can be wonderful writers. They're pre- exactly, and 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 I mean, one thing I've heard is you know get get about a million words out or so, and then you'll start to be a lot better. So you might as well start early. One of my one of my things is I don't, I'm not real big on, on on rules of writing because that's just basically what somebody figured out works for them for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the writing every day thing that sounds good and it's a simple piece of advice for somebody who's just starting out. But what it'll evolve into is you find a way to write on a regular basis in some way that fits your schedule and the demands on your life, and you have to treat it as importantly as you treat anything else. So if you if you're if you are serious about being a writer, you have to build it into your schedule somewhere just like you would build working out at the gym or taking your kids to school or t- reading to your kids at night before they go to bed. You have to treat it just like – or your job even. You just have to treat it with the same degree of importance and you have to get your family to respect that too. It's like, okay, I'm writing now. That doesn't mean I'm, I can go help put the bed together or I can help bring in groceries from the car. I'm – trying to do something or this is not the day we're going to go antiquing because <laughs> I'm home writing. You know, it's like it took a while for my family to, 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 to get that. It's like, okay, when I'm writing, this is not just me goofing around. I'm actually trying to work here. Uh, I mean, this is the experience of anybody who works from home too, actually is, Oh, yeah. dude, you can just throw in another load of laundry. It's like, no, I'm trying to do something that's, yeah. you know, and I, and I was, productive. I was a for several years before I left my day job. And in the beginning it was like that. It's like, well, you're home. You got nothing better to do. No, I'm, no, my employer actually does expect me to do my job. <laughs> Funny about that. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. No, I was gonna say, and I, but I mean, I can't. Yeah, sure, I can do the laundry. I mean, and I will do that. I mean, I, I did that for years. In fact, it was, you know, it was just a default thing. I did the laundry, and I would cook, and I would pick the kids up from school or daycare because I'm home. Why not do those things? So I just, I just built. A, I learned how to build a schedule to include all of that. Mm-hmm. I'm big on time management. I'm big on, you know, I can I can coordinate these 15 minutes to do these two things and then get on to the next project. Sounds good. And speaking of next projects, what is uh, what is coming up? What are you working on? You know, what what's the future for Dayton Ward? Well, I've, actually, this seems to be my year, apparently. I've got three books coming out in the next month and a half. Um, the first one is an unusual book. It's uh, a Star Trek travel guide to the planet Vulcan which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, <laughs> it, is a, it, is a, it is a fictitious travel guide that will you know, inform the traveler about all the cool points of interest and in photo ops and places to eat and places to stay and all that sort of stuff while visiting the planet Vulcan. Uh, Everything's vegetarian there, though, isn't it? No, you know, you'd be surprised. Uh, I, tried to, I, I had fun with it. I was encouraged to, to, to be a little irreverent with it. Be very convers. It's a very conversational book. It's not very. It's not very. You know, 
it's not a, it's not written by Vulcans. It's written by like people who work at a travel place, you know, or people who write travel books. It's that kind of thing. So okay. the same way somebody would be contracted to write a book about, you know, tour guide for Japan. It's the same idea. Got it. So there's, it's de definitely not written from a Vulcan perspective. Now there are bar parts of it that are written from a Vulcan perspective, but they're included like sidebars. Okay. Stuff like that. Yeah, I had fun with it. I was encouraged to to let loose a little bit and 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 not be constrained by, ex, you know, what people think of as far as Balkans have. You know, I was I was able to, you know, have a little, but poke a little fun at it without poking fun. You know, laughing with, not laughing at, that kind of thing. Okay. I had a good time with it. What's uh, Purgatory's key? That is the third book in a trilogy that will celebrate the original Star Trek series 50th anniversary. Um, the, first, the, the trilogy is called Legacies, and the first book is called Captain to Captain, written by Greg Cox, and that book is out now. Mm -hmm. uh, book two is written by David Mack, and it's called Best Defense. It will be out the last Tuesday in July, and then we will follow a month later uh, with book three, Purgatory's Key, written by myself and Kevin. Fantastic. Anything else coming up? I do. One more. My favorite. I think my favorite one from the last couple of years because it's a show that I really love. Uh, it's a 24 novel, Jack Bauer. Um, it's actually a prequel set before the events of the television series. So before he's a counter-terrorist agent okay. and before he becomes all cynical and, and yells, damn it, a lot. It's, uh, <laughs> he's a younger, raw, more raw uh, kind of agent. Doesn't really have that Jack Bauer mystique built up around him yet. So um, I had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, the people at uh, Fox were incredibly supportive. Uh, during the writing of the book, and I can't wait for people to read it. Fantastic. I'm going to have, uh, there's going to be a lot of links that come that uh, will accompany this uh, video so that uh, people can check out uh, your books and also, of course, your Amazon author page, which is probably the easiest way to find everything, at least that Amazon knows about that you've written. Um, where can we find you online other than there? My website is DaytonWard.com, and mm -hmm. uh, that is the I call it a portal because it's really just a, a, a gateway to my author platform is what they call it now. Okay. Uh, so my blog uh, is uh, which I call the fog of award is there. And then uh, I also have links to my Facebook page and my Twitter page and my uh, Instagram page. I probably spend way too much time on social media. <laughs> Well, you know, this is a social media degree I'm getting, so I certainly don't mind. And I know that there are uh, pages for you on both Macmillan and Simon & Schuster. Well, hot dog. I didn't know about the Macmillan one. All right. Oh, I have that. I'm... <laughs> I, I am researcher here. So uh, anyway, uh, I think we're uh, just about out of time. So I'd like to thank uh, Dayton Ward for uh, your time. And uh, uh, you got anything else? No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Great, thanks. And uh, once again, this is Janet Gershon Siegel for The Lonely Writer, because an independent writer never has to be alone. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.